Hello, hello, and happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to episode 27 of the Plight Attendant Show. This is the weekly series I created for everything we're curious about, challenged by, or just want to talk more about. And today we're talking about something that actually is being talked about a lot, which is your job search. But we're going to do it a little bit differently today. We're going to talk about giving your job search the makeover that it probably needs. And we are joined by somebody who is an expert in this area. She is a certified career coach. She's an executive coach. She's a career strategist. She is all over this topic and she is the owner of um, a very special company, mpwrservices.com. And I'm going to be showing her contact information, but this is Anjan Duso. And if you've seen her on LinkedIn, of course you have, because she is a top career development coaching voice on LinkedIn. She's been featured everywhere. She is somebody who's got incredible insight and great information, tips, tricks, tools, all these things you need to do, strategies to get yourself from that point of feeling stuck in your search to really being successful in your search. And I'm excited to get to talk to her today about this really important topic that matters to everybody's life. But before we do, as we always do, just a couple of housekeeping notes uh, to get us started. So number one, as you already are, I see Carrie, I see Leslie. I'm so excited to see you guys. As you come into the chat, take that moment, introduce yourselves, let us know where in the world you are watching us from. Any questions or comments you have for Anne or myself, please don't be shy. Let us know. As always, you can always find us as well on uh, live streaming every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We live stream on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitch. Special shout out to the Plight Attendant uh, on YouTube. Uh, we are growing there and really good stuff is happening there. So I invite everybody, of course, to subscribe there. And the final housekeeping note is just the most important one, which is gratitude for you guys. Welcome, Gus. I see you coming into the chat. You know, the show doesn't happen without you. The work that we do doesn't happen without you. And I am incredibly grateful that you chose to spend a little bit of your day either live with us in the studio or on the, re the replay to get, you know, just to kind of hang out and talk about this important topic and let us know your thoughts on it as well. So without further ado, I definitely want to welcome Anne. I've got her contact information below here. I've got her website. I've got her LinkedIn. Uh, definitely connect with her if you are not already. And um, yeah, welcome. Without further ado, I'm so glad to have you here today. So thank you for joining me. Thank you. You're making me blush that intro. Thank you so much. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm so excited to have you here. This yeah. is such an important topic. I see so many people expressing real frustration in the, you know, my feeds on, on all social platforms, but also, you know, with the people that I talk to one-on-one, -on -one, I'm sure you're seeing the same thing. And so, you know, when it comes to modernizing your job search, when I say that, like what comes to your mind as an expert in this area? Yeah. Well, look, the whole job market has changed drastically, right? I mean, and we know for, you know, decades, right? Cyclical, right? The, you know, it goes into a hiring modes, goes into where it's more in the, the labor markets, more in the employee's favor. Um, but what I'm talking about here is actually the job search itself and the job search market. And that has changed quite a bit since the pandemic. Um, and truly 2020 kind of was a shifting point. So what I'm seeing is that so many people who relied on these techniques that they've done their whole career, right? So I work with a lot of mid to senior career women. Um, you know, they are trying these techniques and they're frustrated because it's just not working anymore. Um, and that's for a number of reasons, right? Like, the you know the the market itself is volatile and it is one where there are a lot of candidates for any open position i had one client who was hiring because i also do leadership coaching as well and mm -hmm. she had one position for a video um a videographer and she opened it up and within two days she had like 1200 applications and that is absolutely wacko compared compared to what it used to be right yeah um yeah. and a big part of that is globalization and remote work and it the, all good things but then things that can also make it a little bit more difficult when you're in your job search absolutely uh, you know i was talking with somebody uh last week about that number of candidates that you see that LinkedIn will show you and how that can be very daunting and prevent people 
from, you know, taking action on that opportunity. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, that plotting of your next career move, I know you have some very specific strategies for people to, to kind of a path to follow when it comes to understanding what may or may not be the right opportunity for you. Sure. Yes. Yes. So that's part of my whole career clarity boost program. And, you know, people come to me and they say, you know, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure what I should be doing next because whatever, for whatever the case it may be, it wasn't working. <laughs> right. So people leave jobs now. Most of the time they're not incredibly thrilled with something, whether they're feeling overworked, burnt out, yeah. undervalued, underpaid, um, not recognized. Right. Yep. So when they come to me, it may not be that they want a huge career change, right? Like they may not move from marketing manager to say like they want to open a bakery or sometimes they are, right? They're saying like, let's change everything up. Yeah. But they know something's not right. So when I talk about plotting your career move, I'm talking about being much more intentional and doing that kind of deeper inner work first to make sure that you are clear and you know exactly what you want next. And you know what you don't want. A lot of people know what they don't want. That's the easy part, right? But then understanding right. what they do want is where they get stuck. Um, and it really comes down to mindset. <laughs> you know, it really comes down to mindset on a lot of different things. First being like, what do you do best? Asking yourself, what comes natural to you? What are what are your strengths? Those things, once you uncover those, and there's a lot of tools to help you get there. Um, mm -hmm. That's the stuff you want to lean into because Gallup has shown that people who use their strengths at work are happier. They're more fulfilled. They take less sick days. Um, yeah. You know, it is, it, it's something that you feel like you can sustain in a place. So values is a big part of that. Um, another part of that is, or sorry, strengths is a big part of that. Another part of that is your values. What's most important to you? And when I say values, they may change the ranking and the order of your values may change over time. Because I can tell you right now, my, my career values and what's important to me right now is different than what it was three years ago, different than my 20s. I'm so glad to hear you say that because it ha there, it has to evolve and change over time. And so I think that's such an important thing to talk to your clients about, about mm -hmm. where they are at that point in their lives, not where they used to be, what they used to think yes. was, was right for them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And where you want to go looking to the future too. So I, I think so many times people stick in the, they, they, they're in a snapshot of present or past mm -hmm. and don't look to the future. And that can get you caught up in your search too. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Do, so when it comes to the sort of, you know, I know that's a mistake that some people make where they're not clear on their values, they're not clear on yeah. what they exactly want. Are there any sort of strategies that you help them get clear on those things? Is that something that you also work with them on? Yes, absolutely. And that's what we talk about. Like, so we go through and some of those strategies are looking at your strengths. What I call, like to call it is the trifecta, right? You look at your strengths. You look at your values and then you look at what genuinely um, internally interests you. And if you think of it like a Venn diagram, like the circles, and you want that little point in the middle, and mm -hmm. that is going to be the place where you feel more fulfilled. Um, now, we also obviously look at, so what does that mean um, yeah. in the real world? And a lot of it isn't, you know, people think I have to get 16 more credentials. I need to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars. I need to start over. I hear that a lot. And you yeah. don't need to start over. Um, you have years and years of experience, many people, depending where you are in your career, um, that you could pull from. And so we start digging in a little bit and start thinking about what were those memorable moments? What were the moments that stick out to you that you loved in your career? Where you felt really fulfilled, where you felt yeah. successful, um, defining success. That's another one. Because if you don't know what success is to you, or if you just think it's a dollar number, that doesn't that, always work. <laughs> I'm curious about that. What do you find that most people, when they are defining success for themselves, is it something that is usually tied to a compensation amount or something else? Yeah, I think it's funny. And the, the gut reaction for people, it is, it's related to what's my compensation and what's my title? And have I grown? Am I going up? 
the latter, right? That is the societal view of success that maybe even passed down from previous generations, yes. previous, um, it, it just in different cultures. And it's, it's funny because it's pretty ubiquitous. <laughs> um, you know, you know, I talk to people who are, you know, in India or in China or in the U S and a lot of them have that same thing about thinking yeah. like we need to move up. And if you're not moving up and if you're not continuing, you're taking a step back and that means yeah. you're not successful. Right. And so we try to dig beyond that and go, yeah. all right, because that's just a surface level. That's not mm -hmm. really what's successful. That So Paul has a, a comment here. He says, and I'm curious, I see a lot of people who are job seeking focus so much on getting certifications, like you just mentioned, right? Yeah. And learning, and wouldn't it make more sense to network and build relationships? And I think that's really topical given what you were just talking about, about those certifications and adding things that may not add value to your well. bottom line. Sure. And it's going to depend, of course, on the uh, on your path and what you want to do. You may have a skills or a learning gap that does need to be addressed if you choose yeah. to go into a path that maybe isn't something that's typical or, you know, like the traditional path that where you've been. However, yes, I think that that's absolutely dead on, Paul, where, you know, thinking about uh, networking and leveraging others within your network and growing that network. And, and that we, we, I know we're going to be talking about that in part of the smart searching, but absolutely, yeah. that is certainly something that I think um, is something that's worth investing your time into. Yes. Yes. And Carrie, that was Newman. Uh, Ann and I were talking about this before we went live that Newman would probably make an appearance um, uninvited, but there he is. So going back to what we're talking about here. So, you know, and I know we're going to get to networking uh, in a minute, but tell me a little bit more about the smart search strategies that, that you offer uh, your, your clients and when you're working on that. Sure. So when we think about what might have happened and what might have worked before, um, you know, one of the things, there's a couple of different things here. Um, one of the things that is no longer effective is kind of that people call it like the numbers game, right? You just have to, they also say spray and pray where you spray your resume out to as many places as possible because it's a numbers game. And you're going to pray that you get callbacks on one or two because, you know, it's a certain percentage that can work, but it can work to a you know, it, it may not be the most, <laughs> it may not be the most fulfilling work, right? If you're just trying to do numbers and make it a game, yep. you may get the interview, you may get the job, but it may not align with the stuff we talked about before, the clarity, yes. with what your, it, you know, your values, your strengths and your interests. Yes. But yes. even more than that, it often doesn't work that easily. <laughs> it's a lot of work. That is yeah, a yeah. lot of work to go, even if you get like some sort of shady automation tool, which are out there, right? To just yeah. like put your application in 500 places at once. Yes. Um, it's a lot of work and it's a, you know, a lot of remembering like, which, who am I talking to again? What is this for? And it burns you out. Yes. And I'll talk, you know, I have clients come to me that are like in crisis mode because they are like, I just had two months and I've put 120 different um, resumes and applications out and I've gone on 16 interviews and I'm burning out. <laughs> and, and I can tell you, I, having been a hiring manager and department head for more than a decade, one mm -hmm. of the things that was very obvious to me was when I would get a resume that clearly was very sort of templated out and not specific to my job. And yeah. like most people, when we have that opportunity, on the other side of the applicant, the hiring manager, in, in some cases, I know this was the case for me, by the time you've gotten approval for the rec, you've done your research, you've gotten the budget you know, in front of someone, you've gone to bat for this position that you need to do a very specific set of tasks and work that are going to bring value to the company and the customer, you know, you're very careful about those resumes and you're very careful about who you want to bring in because you want, you need that, that to be a very successful relationship. And of course, we spend a lot of time at work. And so it's got to mean it really should mean something more than that compensation, right, that we were talking about right. earlier. And so I could always tell when, yeah, after years of doing it, when someone just wanted any job, they didn't necessarily want my job. They wanted any job. Um, yep. That's a that's a difficult conversation to have. And it's usually one that 
is never had because that is not something that moves forward in the process. And that's hard to communicate to people. So I think that the work you're doing, especially when it comes to that clarity, right? Getting clear on what it is that you really want next and then tying that to your values, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and going back to that, like when we're talking about, you know, being clear and knowing exactly what you want to go for. um, I think I was sharing earlier with you that so many people, they just have like this buffet of titles that they'll put that they're looking for. Like I can be a program manager or a customer success manager or communications or DEI. And then it's like you get kind of mental whiplash looking at that as a hiring manager or a recruiter. And it really signifies that that person may not know what they want, even if that's not necessarily the case. (laughs) Yep. Um, Yep. That's what it's signaling, right? And so trying to rein that back in and articulate your value and really focusing in on professional branding, which may not have been as important. That's another mistake people make. They just go right into the job boards and that's it. And they don't think about um, how are they presenting themselves and articulating their value within a business impact framework. Um, Because you can be clear and you want to be talking about your values and all that stuff. You need to think about in the job search. It's really about how are you going to help them? (laughs) Yes. You know, I often liken a, a job opportunity or a job posting to a problem that is being posed and how are you the answer for that for that problem there's a need that needs to be filled how are you the answer for that and can you match yourself up with that absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah you're you're dead on right there yeah um, I wanted to um, bring in a couple of comments. So uh, Leslie is, is saying clarity requires looking inward. Yes. And then communicating it outward. Um, and so thank you uh, for sharing golden nuggets. Anne is, is, like I said, she's just a wealth of information. There was a comment earlier about overqualification. Uh, Gretchen and Anne, is it anything to being overqualified? Mm-hmm. I have a friend she and she is uh, top tier in her industry. She has hundreds of rejection letters a week. Could it be, could overqualification be a factor there? What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, I, I'm not going to speak directly about your friend because your no, friend, there might be a lot happening that we don't know behind the scenes, but, but a hundred of rejection letters a week that stood out to me. Well, that right. You? Right. So something's, something's obviously not working there. Right. Yeah. Well, that also means that she's applying to hundreds of places a week too. So that goes back to the whole going um, broad instead of going deep. Um, So in terms of the overqualification, yeah, I mean, look, unfortunately, it's a reality that I don't want, you you know, we can't sugarcoat it. People have discrimination and bias. And some people may look at something and say, like, say you were in the past a director level, but now you just want to have a manager level or something like that. They may look and people feel, you know, they bring their own insecurities as hiring managers. Um, They may not be even aware that they're doing it, (laughs) but that that would be part of it. I mean, most likely they aren't aware. That's a very good point. I I, I always tried to have the philosophy of hiring people who are better at something than I was because that you you level up really well that way. But you can have that. And I think for the applicant, that can be difficult not knowing what's on the other side of that. And so they're not there's part of the conversation that they're not privy to during the application process. And so that can also be a challenge. But that's why I think your advice about getting very clear on what you want and where you you bring value, what you're really good at is really very, very. I mean, it's genius because that's the thing that's going to make you shine anyway. Trying to be all things to all people and that jack of all trades actually doesn't open the doors that you think it will. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, when it comes to overqualification too, that's, it's all a mindset, right? So part of, you know, this may be an unpopular opinion here because people hate cover letters and I'm actually one of them. I don't like doing them myself, (laughs) but here's the big, the big, but that is the place, especially when you're looking into something like looking for a job and you may think people may go, um, you know, look at that and say you're overqualified. That's your opportunity to share that in the application process. And to say, you know, with my previous experience in directing, blah, 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 you know, but say like what I'm really looking toward, what appealed to me so much about this position is to really 
hone in deep in management level, you know, get into there and explain it right up front and address that elephant or potential elephant in the room. I and love that. Really, yeah. It really works with career transitions as well. If you're going from one industry to another. I think that is so smart because I know there's a lot of discussion about the cover letter and it can be a little villainized in some ways, but it really can be a great opportunity to hone your, for lack of a better word, elevator pitch for yourself. Yes. What separates you, you know, and makes you yes. like much more of an ideal match for that need that that company or department has. So yes. I think if you look at it in that way, that perspective shift is really very smart. Yeah. Right. And that, so, and that kind of, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, so further back to the, or your friend, right? Like I would think about being more intentional about the types of jobs she's applying to. Um, and again, going deep and finding, maybe having a uh, target list of companies and or jobs that look really appealing and focusing in and spending more time on articulating your value that way through whether it's cover letter, whether it's um, networking and calling it folks to try to get, uh, you know, your resume to the top of the pile. Because again, remember, you have about potentially have thousands of people now that you have all these automated systems they're going through. No, a bot is not taking out your resume, but there are some filters in there, right? And so you do need to want to stand out. And the best way still, it's like what's old is new again, um, is getting a referral and getting somebody who absolutely says, listen, this is so-and-so I can vouch for her. I'm, it's, yeah. it's called third party validation, right? So definitely, definitely. Yeah. So we have... <laughs> Yeah, we have somebody asking, you know, do employers still read cover letters these days? And I can tell you again, going back to when I put that old hat on that I used to wear as one. Uh, yeah, I did. I mean, if somebody took the time to write it, I wanted to read it because, again, when I'm there are other things I needed to look at. My team was a creative services you know, and content generation team. And so a portfolio was was absolutely necessary for me to be able to look at. However, that cover letter can also give me insight into that candidate. It's a little more of your personality that you get to show me, you know? Yeah. 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 And it's, it is, it's true. Listen, I know a lot of people aren't reading them these days, especially yeah. there's, I think there's some differences in generations too. Um, yeah. And some of the younger generations are not reading them as much where they feel like it's an extra step. And I get it, especially when now it's not just, oh, hand your resume in a cover letter. Yep. Now it's retype in all of your resume into right? the application system, answer five essay questions, yes. oh, let's attach a cover letter. And that's where it can get really frustrating. Um, yes. But there is there are some hiring managers do right and i will tell you gretchen just like you in my previous career i was an in integrated communications and marketing and when i hired yeah the ones with cover letters stood out and the ones that weren't just a form like <laughs> i'm writing because i'm interested in this job you know something that told yeah. me something about them um so yeah, it did stand out and there's creative ways to do it too. Some people do cover videos. It depends on your industry and your yep. comfort level and um, what's appropriate. But, you know, my philosophy is if it can help you do it. Yep. Um, and it, for, as far as cover letters go, it can only hurt you if you don't, but it can't, it, it can't, it, it can only help you. I don't know. You know what I'm that, trying to say there. No, that, that actually is a really good, that's a very salient point to make is yeah. that when you think of that cover letter, you know, if you don't think that it's going to really help you, it, it could hurt you not to have one. It is that extra. So that's a really good and smart perspective to have. And also, like I say, there's going to be that question that somebody's going to ask you at some point, should you be invited for an interview? about what about the job? What about the company? Oh, Those yeah. kind of things. You've already thought that through when you've written that cover letter. So you're ahead of the game just by doing it. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't like to do it, you're ahead of the game by doing it. So think of it as an exercise, if nothing else, that's going to help move you forward, you know, in terms of your own response yep. and understanding why that particular position appeals to you and matters to you. Hi, Nathan. I'm so glad you joined us. <laughs> Yeah. And then that, that goes back to, again, why you don't apply to hundreds of places at once. Because, yeah, you will burn out if you try to write cover letters, try to write, you know, do all these applications. It, it's impossible. Um, or, you know, that's where they say 
searching for a job can be a full-time job and it can, um, but you can also take it and kind of time manage yourself and take it in chunks. Yeah. Um, I like to work with clients and create a 90 day plan so that it's, okay. it's a three, I mean, it depends on where you are, right? Like if you're out of work and you need a job now that might not work yeah. for you, but um, if you are thinking in advance, um, and actually, I just want to point out, Gretchen, that's one thing that I think the biggest mistake people make in the job search is thinking mm -hmm. it's like a faucet. And they only turn it on when it's time, like they want a new job. And that is what, <laughs> what the biggest mistake is, because it doesn't work like a faucet, like networking and nurturing um relationships, that's not something that is transactional or if it is, it doesn't work very well. I have to put your contact information back up because <laughs> that, that is such, such good insight for people. You know, when the need arises, doesn't, is it the only time to address the mm -hmm. possibility? And so again, if you're not connected with Anne on LinkedIn or don't know her website, it is right here, like under my finger, please can, you know, do that connect with her because this is the kind of insight that her expertise can help you with. But, you know, likening the job search to a faucet, I, I've not heard it put that way. And I think that's brilliant because that is when most people turn it on. That is when most people <laughs> think about it when they have that, that, you know, very present need as opposed to building those relationships. And again, that support system, that network all along yeah. the way, you it's know, your clarity, right? Like the clarity work doesn't work. If all of a sudden you need a job tomorrow, like right. it can work, but it, it takes time and deliberation. And that's the whole point. So to be ahead of the game, you know, thinking about what your values are and again, taking stock maybe once a year, because that does change over time. Yes. Yes. You know, that also reminds me of something. What do you advise people to do all along? Let's say they've gotten that new certification or they've gotten a promotion, those kind of things. And do people in your in your experience with your client, do they tend to wait until they have a need to update their documentation? And then we're they kind sure of do. Yeah. <laughs> they do. I mean, listen, the, the beautiful thing about things like LinkedIn, which I cannot talk enough about LinkedIn, because that is I mean, that is the place that everybody goes. It doesn't matter if you're on a job board for Indeed or Idealist or somewhere else. The mm -hmm. first thing the recruiters and the hiring managers are going to do are going to Google you. And one of the yep. very first things that comes up is your LinkedIn profile. Yep, um, absolutely. So that's where, you know, the beautiful thing about that, about having that already be there and you just kind of like nurture it, right? Like just water it a little bit like it's a, a plant <laughs> instead of having to start from scratch. That's a lovely thing. Um, so that when you do earn those certifications, put them right up. Yeah. Where people do wait, though, is the resume. They don't necessarily update their resume. Um, a lot of people, you know, the, the only time they start thinking about accomplishments might be two mm -hmm. times in their life. Right. One is when it comes for an annual performance review time. Right. And then they're like scrambling, trying to look and like, oh, my gosh, how do I do this? And then the other is. Well, I should say a couple of different times. The other is, you know, if they want to ask for promotion or get a new job. And that's yep. when they're like, oh, and again, then you're in scramble mode instead yep. of going yep. and doing it along the way. Yeah. And I think, too, and, and tell me what you think about this. If you are doing that all along the way and you're updating your documentation, you're thinking about those things all along the way, doesn't that also help you increase your confidence because you're making note of all those things? And so when it is time to have those conversations, that confidence comes through because it's not something you just remembered that you did. It's something you've built on along the way. Absolutely. I mean, that's such a great point. Not only is it confidence building, but it's also competence building because you're, you, you know exactly what you've done. Um, you are able to articulate that value in daily conversations. And yeah. I tell people to practice, you know, they're like, oh, I haven't gone on an interview forever. I'm like, yes, you have. You've even talked to somebody who you've met like at a, you know, I don't know, a church function or something that you've never met before. And you're saying hi, and you're telling them who you are. Um, yeah. That's part of your, as you called before, your elevator pitch. And you have lots of opportunities to practice that. But you can also add all of those other little things. Like you said, I mean, obviously, if you're out at a, a kid's soccer game, you're not going to be talking about the, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, the, the millions of dollars you saved your company. But there are opportunities to kind of 
practice some of these things um, and keep them fresh so that it's not digging back, scrambling. um, And then again, there's that stress again that comes up and why people burn out. Yes, that, you know, that sort of misalignment. And I think that you made a really good point earlier. And again, I want to go back through because we've been talking about these strategies that pe- that you teach people how, how to use. Getting clear on what you want to do next is, is definitely a big one. What do you <laughs> want to do? Because again, the people who are doing using the spray and pray method and are applying for everything and have a bunch of different titles that they you know, are like, I can do any of these that there's a, there's a fundamental misalignment there. They're not quite sure where they bring value. And that is a recipe for burnout. And, you know, working with someone like you is a great way to kind of get that clarity around where do I really want to focus my time? Where do I really want to spend my time? Yeah. And, you know, part of it on the flip side of that too, the, you know, like I work with a lot of high achievers is that they can bring value in so many different places. So that's why, and that's why I said they might not, not actually be confused, but yeah. they're saying, but I can do project management and I can do this and I can, and you bring it all into one little, like I said, a buffet of titles and it makes, it appears as if you're confused or maybe overly optimistic because sometimes people are like, can you really do all that? Well, that's um, a really good point. Yeah. yeah. And I, it's not necessarily because they're, it's because they really do bring so much yeah. and they're trying to put all of it into one spot. Yeah. And Bruce is asking if you can over update your resume. Yes. And yes, you can Bruce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what I mean by that is look, your resume is supposed to be a snapshot for what you do best and the value you can bring again, back to Gretchen for that certain position. Right. And that's why it's so important to know the positions you want to go for the general vicinity of them, right? So that you're not creating 16 different, completely different resumes, one geared towards the project management, one geared towards customer success. That's where you can get overwhelmed, burnt out, and you won't be putting your best foot forward. So your resume doesn't need to show everything you've done in your entire career, especially if you're someone like me who may be a little long in the tooth, <laughs> a little older, like you have a lot of experience, you know, you're going to write yeah. a lot of different things. Yeah. It, you don't need that. You know, like 10 years is one of the things that people say 10 to 15 years. If you've had things that were super relevant and that were previous to that, if you're not doing a chronological resume and you're doing more of a functional resume, which I, I know I'm throwing out some terms here. I'm not sure if everyone knows what they mean, but <laughs> if, I mean, if do you want to let them know what those mean? Sure. Okay. So chronological is the one everyone's used to, right? Like you yeah. put the most recent experience than the job before that. Um, What they call a functional resume is really focusing on those skill sets first, right? And saying, so this works really well for somebody who may be um, transitioning from one um, career path to another. So say you want to move into DEI, but you did something else. Um, And looking at the skills and, you know, a lot of times they're soft skills that translate those transferable skills and putting them up front and center, and then talking about the examples and the accomplishments that tie to those skills. So they're not necessarily in chronological order, and you can pull from something maybe you did 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and highlight it up front. Interesting. Okay. If you have just joined us, we're now at the bottom of the hour, but you know, we've got a career and executive coach. Uh, she's a certified expert uh, and Jen Dusa, who's been here with us now. She's going to be here with us to the end of the hour. And we are talking about how to modernize your job search and some of the key sort of challenges, mistakes, if we want to call them that, that people are making that are kind of keeping them further from their goal and how she helps her clients and others sort of overcome those things, overcome those hurdles, those challenges with smart strategies, smart searching, getting clear on what they want to do, where they bring value, you know, those kind of things, where they see themselves, and then also how to apply that to their job search. And so she's given us some great tips. Again, if you've just joined us, you know, definitely check out the replay to get the first half. And we're going to keep going with this because it's, it's really good. And we've got some really good comments and questions from the audience. The one we just covered was, can you ever over update your resume, which I've never heard that question before. And that's an excellent thing. And so Anne was letting us know that, yes, you can do that. And, you know, 
what to include and what not to include on your resume. And so I, I just think that 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 was a brilliant recap of that. Um, if you if you uh, thank you, Edgar. <laughs> So it's nice to see you here. Um, so, you know, when you're working with your clients and let's say that somebody comes to you with a three pager mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they, they just, they're clinging to each little thing cause it's their <laughs> life raft. And how do you kind of, how do you help them out and, you know, to understand that, that, that may not be their, their best, their best play. Sure. Well, and also, first, I want to say, you know, I want to give you a caveat. There's a difference between a CV and a resume and in different yes. industries, different things are required. And they use the term resume interchangeably sometimes. So I do just want to say that there are some places like in um, higher academia or yep. in the healthcare industry when you're working, um, not necessarily in healthcare administration, but actually in as like a nurse or a doctor, places yes. like that, that they do require everything chronological order how many places you were published in anytime you spoke everything and that can be like a 15 page thing very um, critical yeah thank so you i do want to just say like it's not everybody that needs to like cut everything down to one to two pages um so first we talk about that a little bit and say like what are we looking for and I, you know i will also say a huge mistake people make about their resumes is they're looking backward. And I, I think I might've mentioned that earlier is that oh yeah, people are thinking I need to represent what I've done instead of thinking, how does this apply for the future? So it is a small shift, but a profound one. Um, so for example, in your resume, uh, many people will put their title that they currently have front and center, or they don't put anything at all about on top, and it's just their name. Yeah. Um, and that is fair, right? People do that because that's how they present themselves. But you want to think about the job you want to have, and it's almost like that whole dress for the job you want. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one you have. And if you think about that as your resume, dressing up your resume for the job you want, not the one yes. you have. Um, and so in that case, you know, putting the title, your target title is going to be much more important. And it also helps with keywords and all sorts yes. of things, right? There's, there's some search engine optimization going on. There. Absolutely. Um, so good. But uh, that is, again, another way to shift looking forward instead of looking back at accomplishments. And that goes kind of where you talked about before to tie the accomplishment for how is that going to help impact the new company? Right. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you know, I, I look at the the entire application process as an ongoing mm -hmm. conversation that you're having yes. with that potential future employer. Sure. That's a relationship that you're trying to build. And so all along the way, when you're in a relationship, there's a give and take. There's it's not like you said, transactional. Right. There's a mutually beneficial agreement that you're all going to have. And so you want to be sure that, again, you are helping them under, understand the value that you can bring to their enterprise, right? To help solve their problems. Yeah. Right. Always make it about that. I know that sounds a, a little counterintuitive because we're always, th you know, my on the other side, on the clarity side, I'm always saying, make sure you're thinking about what's important to you. And you want to bring that out too. And there is a place for that in the interview um, process. Once you start having that dialogue to start asking questions about, um, how they approach such in certain situations, more behavioral kind of questions that will help you get to the the real answer as if they align with your values or not. Yeah. Um, so there there is a place for that. But I think the pendulum swung a little bit too far where a lot of candidates now are focusing only on that or focusing so much on that, that they're forgetting that they actually have to sell themselves <laughs> and the way to sell yourself is to showcase how you are the solution to that problem and that you know making it about the company and that you've yeah. done your homework and that you know who they are and and that you're willing to listen and learn because we don't know everything just from reading and researching <laughs> online um, right it's a good start and that's a great way to like say hey i have some ideas and come up with a point of view but also acknowledging that there's a lot behind the scenes 
I think there's also, that's also a really good point. And it's another reason why, and I'm going to put your contact information back up here, because it's another reason why I think it's important for people to understand the value of working with a coach like you, who's got that expertise, who has that perspective, because a lot of times we can get very myopic about our own lives, our own skills, our own goals, and we can sort of turn a blind eye, if you will, to yeah. other opportunities or to maybe a different way to approach something. And so I think that that's another benefit of working with a career coach like yourself, because you have that experience, you have that perspective and you also, I mean, you have a wealth of experience with a vast number of people. And so I, I think that's, that's just really important. So I wanted to mention that again, because I know a lot of people kind of shy away or, you know, have had the idea of, well, I'll just do it myself. I can do it myself. It's very difficult to write your own story because we're in our own story. It's very yep. difficult to pull out the achievements because sometimes we feel like that's bragging. Sometimes we don't feel comfortable doing yeah. that, right? I'll tell so you, that's, that's, another, that's a big yeah. thing with women, especially, right? Like a lot of women are don't feel comfortable with putting themselves front and center because they've been, you know, there's a you know, some sort of underlying thing that I, I need to be humble and and meek and my accomplishments will speak for themselves. But if you don't share what they are, it's not going to work. So exactly, exactly. Do you do you find that you have? Um, well, let me ask you, actually, let's talk about about your business and your clients. Sure. I know you you support I think you said at the beginning, and I think I've read that it's women in their mid to upper um professional experience. And I'm saying right. that not in the right way. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, we got it's a gist. You got the gist. <laughs> so do you, do you, do you work exclusively with women or do you also? No, it's not exclusively. That's my, you know, I have to market myself too. Right. And so that right. is who I'm, you know, where my niche was to, to yeah. choose. Um, I primarily work with women. It doesn't mean that there is no like, <laughs> Absolutely not. I do not have gender discrimination, but there are certain things that many women will tell me when they're in their mid and they're looking to kind of like jump into that leadership role and or again, realign their thinking of what success might look like because they yeah. think they need to be in a leadership role because that's what success means in the latter. Um, yes. Where that might not be really what success means to them. It's just what they they've internalized and they've been told success means. So that's where, you know, just my sweet spot goes. Also, I've been there myself, right? So like, it's always easy to talk to people and help people where you might have experienced something and overcome it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I shared with you earlier that I, I used to be in integrated um, communications and marketing. Um, and then I had a career shift, you know, and I, I had a toxic job. I had a job where I didn't do the work. I did not do the deliberate, um, the deliberation and, and introspection. And again, was thinking about that ladder and then the shiny jobs that come along. And I always, you know, I was recruited a lot, right? So it was like, whoever just came to me and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And then just would jump into the next opportunity. I'm yeah. like, oh, got a title increase, got a good salary bump. And unfortunately that doesn't always work. And there was a yes. huge misalignment with my values. Um, and it cost me big, not, not obviously monetarily right away, but like it cost me my health. Um, and yeah. I ended up winding up in the ER and, you know, I had, I was a single mom at the time. It was, it was a tough, tough yeah. time. And so I just ended up quitting with nothing else lined up. And that's when I took the opportunity to really dig deep. Um, and we, you were talking about coach before. Yeah. I am a big fan of coaching and having coaches and I have a coach now for yep. different areas of my life. I will always have a coach. Yeah. Um, I had a coach way back then. I think the, my first introduction to career coaching and having a career coach was probably about 10 years ago. And he kept trying to get me to become a coach, which was funny. But um, yeah, at the time, it was not where I was at. But in any <laughs> rate, uh, the whole, you know, the whole point is, someone to be able to have to mirror back to you and give you that external perspective and help you get to that next phase, whatever yeah. that may be quicker, yeah. <laughs> more efficiently. Yeah. And man, I wish I had paid attention and, and done that, but I was so like in the, in my grind of just like kind of powering through and feeling burnt out. Um, 
So, th so that's my story. <laughs> and, and, and I love that because I think it also adds to, in addition to your training and your years of experience, that life experience also you can bring to your clients because yeah. you understand, like you, you understand a lot of those very real life circumstances and, and challenges and how, you know, they can impact somebody. I think that's really mm -hmm. important. Again, it's, it, it's just the benefit of having someone like a coach in your corner that you can, you know, get real with about this stuff. And it's not, you know, yeah. going to be, I mean, friends and family are great, but they're not always going to have that perspective and they're not always going to perspective is definitely one thing because they, they want your safety and security. So they may not always, yes. they have your best interest at heart, but yeah. they may not, their communication may not actually point you in the direction that is best for you. Right. That's so, so I, Oh yeah, yeah. You're, you're so right on there. And also they may just be, repeating things that worked for them. And yeah. that's great. What works for one person may be great, but it doesn't always work for everybody else. So I never direct my clients saying, do this. This is what you have to do. I help yeah. to work with them to find out what's best for them because they're the only ones who are going to really know what's best Absolutely. for them. I think that is, is just so important. And I'm so glad that you do that. I see Andrew Wilcox has a long comment. Okay. I think it's going to cover us both up if I put it on the screen. We're going to give it a shot. Um, and it said, he says, with the state of the current job market, what do you think about doing contractor work instead, specifically for people going through layoffs? It seems to me at this point, landing a job quickly takes even more effort than finding a client contract. The idea of waiting to be picked is a difficult one for me. I know it's a bit off topic, but just wonder what your take is. Thank you. Oh, Andrew, this is not off topic at all. This is this is like so on topic. I can't even. She's an expert. She's an expert. Yes, it's still totally on topic. Oh, no, but it, it really is. I mean, you you're hitting the nail on the head here, right? I think remember how I said the whole market and job search has changed. You know, the gig economy. We've heard that that term forever, and we always maybe you associate it with something like Uber. It doesn't have to be like Uber or just doing these small jobs here and there contract work. I think the mindset shift that has happened mm -hmm. with um, people before employees were like, okay, I go from one job to another job to another job full time. That's it. Or, or maybe part time. And that was the majority of the opportunity. But now so many people are doing what you're saying, right? They're contracting, they're freelancing. Um, they can, you can call it whatever term you want. Um, consulting, like a lot of people do these things. And it's, it's so smart for a few reasons. Some people, it's what they end up realizing they love and they'd rather do. And then they just, that is where, where they're going to go and they're going to shift things. Other people, they might say, oh, this is stressful. I don't like the new business part of it. You know, so it might not be, it might be a stopgap and stopgaps are great because not only are you earning money, which is something that if you're unemployed, definitely want to get right. But you're building your resume. Um, this yeah. isn't just like a, you know, I'd say, I always say no job is just a throwaway job. Even if, so, you know, people say like, oh, well, I'm just, you know, being a bus driver for a while or whatever it is. No, because you yeah. gain something along the way, yes. every single experience. And with contracting, I think that's even, that's like a great one because it shows that you, you know, it's showing entrepreneurship in a way because yeah. you have to sell yourself. And yeah. if you're finding that you're getting jobs that way, you may want to look into some, I, I know there's in the American job market, um, which is what I'm in, uh, you know, there's things like benefits and health insurance and things that are tied in with full-time corporate employment. Yeah. But you may want to look into that and see if there's another opportunity for you to yeah. get, you know, those benefits and, and see like, you know, crunch some numbers, see what might happen. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great top, a great point rather. And this is a good topic, Andrew, because I think it's something that a lot of people are, that's yeah. a question they're asking themselves. Yep. And one of the salient points that Andrew just made, I really want to highlight that is that, it is still bringing in income. It, the lack of income, especially when you're between, is a huge stress point. It also can begin to, you know, chip away at your se sense of self-confidence and it can actually, you know, hurt you in the long run in terms of getting, you know, moving forward in terms, you know, toward the job you really want. I'm losing my train of thought here because this is such a good topic. 
And it's so important for people to realize that that can also calm you down a little bit. You've got some money coming in. It doesn't have to be the forever thing you want, but if it speaks to your skills and it gives you an opportunity to, to work in that area, absolutely. Why yeah, do that? Yes. And again, Andrew just proved my point too, by asking that question, which he thought was off topic and it was totally on point. Another great reason why working with somebody like Anne as a career coach can help give you that perspective and that information that you may not may not have had on your own or could not have maybe identified on your own. And it's a great benefit. It really is. It's, it's always good to have somebody else to bounce things off of, but also to work through their understanding and their expertise of what's possible and the resources that you have available that you may not even know are there. Yeah. Gretchen, they're going to think you're paying, I'm paying you to say all these nice no, things. No, no, no. And, and and again, you know, I, this, this is a space that I work in and I, I know a lot of the people who come here, but I do the way I do it is, it, you know, we each have different, you know, sort of areas that we specialize in, Yeah. but I'm just like you. I have two coaches. I love them both. I will always have a coach yeah. and it's not that I'm, you know, getting paid to advocate coaching, which is what I do, but it is important that you have somebody yes. that you know is going to have your back or whatever you want to call it, but they're the person that you can go to and say, here's, here's what's happening. And here's what I'm thinking about it. And they can be that lens for you to say, okay, well, maybe have we thought about this? Did you know this is available to you? Right. Those are the kind of things that, that you don't find everywhere. And, and that, you know, you'll have people who might tease that information for you, but with a coach, that is a dedicated, trusted relationship that is going to pay off for you every single time, every single time. Yeah. And no, you're not paying me, <laughs> but you know, no, I know. But, I was just like, <laughs> but it, it 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 is the point of the plight attendant. It's the point of the of this live stream is to bring information, people, and resources in contact and, and you know to other people at a time when they might need them. And so this topic is so great because it is such a volatile job market now. It is different than it used to be. Things have changed, and employers' needs and and you know duration of employment and those kind of things are very different. Budgets are being handled differently, and so I think that's another area where it's really important to understand what resources you have at your disposal that you can that you can tap into to help maybe compress and shorten that that time frame that you're working with to find that next great opportunity that you want. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. again, if you're doing this continuously, if it's not something you're just trying to turn on and off, yeah. that may help too, right? Because that that's not something, again, that you're like, oh, it has to be within two months or it has to be within three. Um, also, just something to remember and, and something that I think it's really hard for a lot of high achievers and maybe people who've been in their career for a while is that the higher you go in terms of title and responsibilities, the fewer positions there are and that inherently leads to a longer lead time. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, maybe it was easier when you were, you know, 10 years ago to get a job um, within two months. And now it might take more like six months to a year or, you know, an executive position can be a year or two. Um, yeah. So, you know, that that's just part of it as well and something to remember when, and, and again, another reason why brushing up on all of this and maintaining um, your networking uh, relationships and, and not just turning them on when you need it. Isn't yeah, I, I, I think that's one of the best points about this conversation is, you know, not not thinking of your job search as that faucet that you mentioned, yeah. right? So that you're always thinking about keeping yourself updated, keeping your documentation updated so that you're always reviewing where you stand, but also getting a good idea of what is important to you, what you like about what you do you know, where you might want to move into and where you don't, but also, you know, understanding that give yourself that leeway, that grace, if you will, to understand mm -hmm. that maybe you can shift a little bit. You can, you can pivot if you need to, you know, you don't always have to stay on that trajectory that we've all been taught society. Mm -hmm. Like that's the way to go. You, you said it very well. And I've, and I've, I've think this is something, and I've said it before, but what does success mean to you? Not to your parents, not to your spouse, not to your kids, mothers and dads. And, and that, what does it mean to you? Is it time with your family? Is it having the, the resources to, you know, 
give your give your kids, you know, writing lessons or go on vacation or skill up and go back to school or whatever it is. But success to you is going to look different than it does to other people. But that's the one that's important. And I think is that's a big challenge that some of your clients do face. And oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And especially when they think they know what success means to them, but then we have to peel back because a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, no, no, I totally get it. And then you're like, but why? And then you ask the why game and the why underneath. And if you, I think it's, you know, you ask why five times and answer it and then you can get through and then you're like, oh, that's what that really means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I will say this, I know we're coming up on five minutes left. And so I just wanted to mention too, that you know, I know in sales, there's that sort of five to seven touch points right before a sale may close. And that's a general you know, sort of thing that, that's out there. But if you think about the job search in that way, there's also probably a set number of touch points and, and that a lot of people may not think of it in that way. It goes back to the spray and pray mentality. I'm just going <laughs> to litter the, the field with my resume and somebody's going to pick it up. As opposed to you may have to do a very succinct and targeted search for what you tr really align with. And it may take a little bit. Let's say you've you've submitted that resume. When should you reach back out? When do you follow up before you've heard anything? Should you follow up before you've heard anything? Are those also things that you work with your clients on? Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, there's... Uh, <laughs> Here's a beautiful thing and, and the frustrating thing about the job search. There's no hard and fast rules. <laughs> you can make your own rules. And honestly, every hiring manager, every recruiter is different. So, you know, what may annoy one isn't going to annoy another. I mean, obviously, there's some general guidelines, but absolutely, I work with them to try to help them understand yeah, you may need to have additional, you will need to have additional touch points, right? Yeah. Um, and that is something that will only benefit you in the end. Yeah, I think that's great. I know we probably have, um, I do know that we have some and stated job seekers uh, in the audience mm -hmm. today. And so I'm going to put again, your contact information back up, but let people know how they can get in touch with you, with you. Yeah, you know, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. I know you are too, Gretchen. So listen, I would love you to follow me. Go ahead, send me a DM. Um, that's the best way to get in touch so that we can talk right away and learn a little bit more about what's challenging you and where you might need some support. Yeah. Do you have anything coming up uh, for, for people? Yeah, well, something. There's going to be an announcement soon. Um, okay. I, uh, right now, I do a lot of one-to-one -one coaching on all of these things that we've been talking about. Um, I have my clarity, career clarity boost, my advanced job seekers toolkit, and then my modern leader series. I'll also be coming up with something very soon, which might be um, in more of a group style format um, nice. to help folks with this, with the personal branding, um, professional branding. I like to say professional branding. Um, nice. To help elevate and articulate your value. I think that's really important for people, especially as they get more familiar with using LinkedIn as part mm -hmm. of their digital presence and their digital toolkit for themselves. And if you don't know, mm -hmm. this is Anne's LinkedIn page. You'll know you're in the right spot when you see <laughs> this. Um, so yeah, definitely connect with her. There's a lot of great information to be had there. Um, and I, and I, and I do love that you're the branding part of it, because I think that's something that is overlooked by many, many job seekers today. There's, mm -hmm. there's, it's just not something that we've traditionally ha have been taught. You need to do this. And so we've got a couple minutes left and what, you know, any parting thoughts on that as sort of an, you know, um, uh, an understanding of how they, you, you can help people with that as well. Sure. You know, my biggest parting thought I'm just going to give overall is that I think people get into thinking um, in a binary that has something has to be this, or has to be this, and there's nothing in between, but there's a lot in between. So when you start feeling stuck, whether it's on the search itself or figuring out what you want to do next or figuring out what just is fulfilling to you, just realize that there are a lot of the in-betweens and a lot of um, choices and it's your choice yeah. and you can go in the driver's seat. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for everybody. We will be, yeah, this was great. Um, again, if you, if you know anybody who would benefit from this, 
point them toward the replay because there's so much, so much good information that we've talked about in this hour. Uh, we will be back uh, next week uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. We will have Charity Hughes as our guest. And I actually would really love to have Anne back to talk about mm -hmm. some other areas of, of career coaching, but also the job search strategies that she works with and just anything else, because I think this has been such a valuable valuable hour for everybody. And I do appreciate everybody showing up. Thank you, uh, Michael and uh, Amanda. It's so good to see everybody here today. We had such great participation from the audience. Thank you for having me. Seriously, I love being here. So thank you. Yeah, this was great. This was absolutely great. So I want to thank everybody for coming. I uh, hope to see you next week. Again, we will have Charity with us in the studio. And uh, until then, I am actually, uh, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> thank Anne, because she that was a great, great uh, answer that she had to that question. And I am going to close it. And we will see you all next week. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Bye.